2003, this is The Ones Who Succeed. I'm Campbell Barron. I'm a 17-year-old entrepreneur, business, and technology enthusiast, and a big fan of today's guest, Mark Cuban. My name is Mark Cuban. I'm on a show called Shark Tank on ABC on Friday nights and all day, every day on CNBC. And I also own a um, basketball team, the Dallas Mavericks. I chatted with Mark via Zoom last Wednesday and was interested to learn more about his entrepreneurial journey, but also what waves and business trends a young entrepreneur like me or maybe someone like you listening to this could take advantage of in the coming years. So I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Can you talk a little bit about your childhood, where you grew up, and kind of how you think that influenced your success? Sure. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, born in a part of town called Squirrel Hill, moved to South Hills, a part of town called Birdland because all the streets were named after birds. I was into sports when I was a kid, but I was also into business. You know, as long as I can remember, my parents, my parents didn't go to college. My dad did upholstery on cars. So if you got a rip in your seat, car seat, you took it to where he worked to fix it. My mom did odd jobs along the way. And so they were always really um, encouraging to me to go out there and try things because my dad's line was, you know, he doesn't know what so I got to figure it all out. And, and so that's what they encouraged me to do. And that's effectively what I did. And just I was just one of those kids that was always hustling, always had something going on, always had, you know, trying to make money in different ways to be able to buy basketball shoes, whatever it was. I mean, my, my first memories of, of hustling, I was repackaging baseball cards and selling them at the park, you know, down yeah. the street. I was selling garbage bags door to door. You name it. You know, I sold magazines door to door. If there was a way for me to pay my bills, I was going to find it. And uh, growing up, do you have any memories of uh, working? What were some of your early jobs? Um, like I said, I, I, jobs I created for myself, you know, the baseball cards. I sold garbage bags door to door so I can get a pair of basketball shoes. I sold magazines. I sold candy. I worked um, the first real job I had um, where I got a paycheck was working for a place called Ralph's Discount in Pittsburgh. And then next time where I got a job, working for a delicatessen called Isley's. Now, what stood out about that, in Pittsburgh, there's this thing called Chip Chop Cam. It's mm-hmm. just in Pittsburgh, you know, but I had to use a slicer and I wasn't very good at it and ended up slicing off the edge of my finger. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah, I didn't get any bone, fortunately, <laughs> but there's blood everywhere. So I never went back there. Um, so it was, yeah, you know, those were my um, high school job adventures. And I think what's interesting um, about entrepreneurship, like I said, I'm really interested in kind of how your childhood influenced uh, who you would become. Uh, wh- what about school? What do you think? How do you think you were you a good student? Did you enjoy it? What was your opinion on it at a young yeah, age? Yeah, like in grade school, I was a good student. I was good at math, you know, like school. And then junior high, we moved. And that was I wasn't I did OK junior high. And then I got to high school, like ninth grade, I think it was my grade suffered you know, who knows why I just, you know, just wasn't into it. But then I, you know, I, my parents really would push me to go to college and, mm-hmm. you know, and because they hadn't. And so, you know, I just got to try to get my act together. And, you know, I was one of those kids that probably had more ability than I showed. And and then probably my junior year, I decided I wanted to challenge myself. So I started taking classes at night at the University of Pittsburgh. Just oh, wow. To what I would do. Yeah. And, my senior year, because my high school wouldn't let me take economics classes, these certain business class. Well, actually, it was my junior year. They wouldn't let me take the economics classes. So I started taking classes at night at Pitt. And then I was like, OK, I, I can do this at Pitt. So I dropped out of high school and went to college at the University of Pittsburgh for what would have been my senior year in high school. And oh, did that's pretty, awesome. did well. So, yeah. That's great. And I think um, and so you are kind of pretty much an always uh, an entrepreneurial person. And, yeah. you know, I read that you started a bar at one point. Yeah. Um, my se- yeah. For my senior year in college. Yeah. Uh, by the time I got to college, I was doing everything back ass half words. You know, I just did it completely different when I, I so I transferred from Pitt to Indiana. I saw mm-hmm. this to the top 10 business schools. I picked out the cheapest one mm-hmm. and it was IU got there. And I remember going to register for classes and I'm like, you know what? I really want to see if I'm smart or not. You know, am I, am I just fooling myself? And so there was back then it wasn't digital. And so you had to wait in line to, to sign up for classes. And so I decided I just snuck into a line for um, the MBA program where the class was introduction to statistics at the mm-hmm. MBA level. And I'm like, okay, I'm 18. If I can nail this class, I can nail anything, right? And so I snuck into the class. They let me register, and I got an A in it. 
And, you know, just to connect some dots, that same professor was a guy named Wayne Winston. He, um, after I bought the Mavs 20 years later, I was in um, Indianapolis watching, well, actually before that, I was watching Jeopardy and I saw him and, and recognized the name and recognized him. He just crushed it on Jeopardy. And then a couple months later, I was in Indianapolis. The Mavs were playing the Pacers and I hear Mark, Mark, Mark from the stands. And it was Wayne Winston, my prof, oh, wow. my stats prof from my freshman year. And I'm like, let's get together. And so I hired him to work for the Mavericks. And he was the first full-time stats um, analytics guy in the NBA. That's and, fantastic. What yeah, a story. I, I snuck in to a fresh, you know, as a freshman to yeah. an MBA program. And then from there, because they thought I was in the MBA program, the next semester I took more MBA classes. And then my sophomore year, I took more MBA classes. And I mean, I was even tutoring people. It was crazy, you know, in finance and accounting. It was just easy for me. Um, and then the head of the business school came up to me, saw me on campus one time, and I guess they figured out what I've been doing um, and just literally was poking me in the chest. I don't know how the hell you pulled this off, Cuban, but you're no longer in the MBA program, da 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 But that let me keep those credits, and I ended up graduating on time. So you really, you really created your own opportunities there in that situation. Yeah, I didn't mess around. I was like... You know, what have I got to lose? Just go for it. And yeah. I, you know, I, I had this thing where my first two years, I was good. I, like I said, back ass half words, right? Mm -hmm. So my first two years, I was going to take all the hard classes so that I could take my freshman and sophomore year classes, my junior and senior year, because then I'll be old enough to drink and I can just party like a madman and don't mm -hmm. have to worry about it. And yeah. So worked out. <laughs> so. So how do we go from how do we go from this kind of enterprising kid in college? You had a bar at one point. How did you just become interested in technology in general? What kind of started that? So after the bar, so I got busted for having my friends drink. There. Yes, yes. And so that got closed down. Yeah. Fortunately, because there's still people that worked for me in the bars back then that are still working in bars in Bloomington. So it's kind of crazy. So I guess it all is well that ends well. And so after IU. I went back to Pittsburgh, got a job at Mellon Bank, and they had me do these things called systems trans systems transitions, I guess, where they would convert these old time banking systems into the new digital systems. Mm -hmm. And so I would do these system conversions. And then they allowed me to, they had these terminals all set up and connected to the mainframes and they allowed me to get on there. So I started teaching myself what effectively was a different, you know, mainframe version of basic. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I can do this. And then I'm, I got tired of the job, you know, and so I went back to Bloomington for a little bit just to hang out. Then I went back, to, came down to Dallas and I, I got a job at night working at a bar. And then during, then I got a daytime job working for a company called Your Business Software, mm -hmm. where it was all PC software. And that mm -hmm. was new to everybody at the time. So I had no choice but to learn it all. Realized yeah. I was really good at it because I could, you know, combine my business skills with technology skills. Taught myself how to do all these database applications and Visual Basic, some C, C++ basic stuff. And just realized, okay, even though I didn't take it in college, I had an aptitude for it. And it seems like throughout your kind of like early life and in college, you really just created your own opportunities. Um, yeah, I and so. For it. Yeah. And so what do you think it was about kind of starting from the bottom, almost like having nothing to lose that kind of fueled your ambition? I mean, you just nailed it. I had nothing to lose. You know, it wasn't like, yeah. you know, I mean, my parents didn't understand the things I was, I was doing. So it wasn't like, mm -hmm. it was like, why are you doing this or why are you doing that? It was always like, OK, just stay out of trouble, you know, you know, do what you can and keep going forward. And, you know, it didn't always work, but, you know, I just kept on pushing forward and just because something didn't work or I got fired from a job or quit a job because I was bored and bounced to the next one, you know, I just kept on going. And, and you know, and, and given the times we're in right now, it's, it's worth noting that the last time unemployment was this high was the year I graduated from college. And oh, so really? It wow. Like that's it was, Yeah, it wasn't like there were a ton of jobs that were just waiting for people. So you, you kind of had to be agile and, and find ways to, to make it work. And and one of your kind of big early successes um, was this company you started called Micro Solutions. Yeah, that was I read after about I got this. fired from your business software. All right, so can you talk a little bit about that? And and what what did your day look like? What were you kind of doing with that company? Uh, with Micro Solutions, so I was working for this company, your business software, and I had a deal I wanted to close because remember I'm living six guys in a three bedroom apartment at the time. I'm sleeping on the floor. It's just nasty, just gross, mm -hmm. and. You know, obviously, I wanted to get out of there any way I could. 
and I, I worked on 10% commission and, and there was a chance for me to close a $15,000 deal and earn $1,500, which was huge. And, and so I called my boss and I was like, look, I need to go close this deal. And some of my responsibilities were to sweep the floor and open up the store. Mm -hmm. And um, he's like, no, you got to open up the store. I'm like, come on, man. And so I made my first executive decision that I'd go out there and get the check thinking, you know, when I brought it back, everything would be cool. Hired me. And so here I am sleeping on the floor, no job. So the first thing my friends and I did was drive to like Lake Charles, Louisiana and get drunk. Right. Because my friend had a little Toyota. My car was busted. It couldn't get wouldn't make it anywhere. And so came back and I said, OK, now I got to start this business and start. And I still have all this stuff. Started taking notes. What do I want to do? Now I knew PC software and could write some soft, my, some programs on um, basic stuff. And so I'm like, OK, I, I need to just start my own business because I've been through, you know, I was 23, 24 years old and already been through four jobs. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, OK, I'm just not a good employee. And so I started this company, Micro Solutions, and we called it Micro Solutions for microcomputer solutions. Ah, I see. Okay. You know, so Smart. we wanted yeah. to be very, very specific. Yeah. And I went around and just started calling on people I had met from the software job. And I found this company called Architectural Lightning. And I was like, look, you know, I know you want this piece of software. If you front me the money, which was 500 bucks, I'll make it work. I don't care mm -hmm. what it takes. I'll walk your dog. I'll wash your car. I'll make it work. I'll make it up to you if it doesn't. And it worked. And then they referred me to somebody else, referred me to somebody else, referred me to somebody else. And I, you know, and just like I did at IU, I just kept on learning and learning and pushing myself and pushing myself. I went seven years without a vacation. And we went from me just setting up PCs with basic accounting software and, you know, batch code to, and, and scripts to, doing, you know, the first PO system for Walmart and integrating video into a database. So Zales didn't have to keep all this inventory and ended up growing to like 80 employees, 30 some million dollars in sales. And I sold it to CompuServe, which is part of H&R Block at the time. And and one of the really interesting things that the takeaway I got from kind of reading about your time at uh, working on micro solutions was, I mean, look, six million dollars, you know, obviously compared to where you are now, that's not that much. But to kind of your ordinary person, that seems like a quite a decent amount of money and a paycheck, it was and it, huge. and it, yeah, and it seemed life changing probably for you at the time. I did retire at the time, so I bought a lifetime pass on American Airlines. I just turned thirty. Yeah, and I was like, I'm just going to party like a rock star. So I, I you know. After I sold Micro Solutions, went out and I found a broker and Raleigh Rawls and Charlie McKinney, who's still my guy today. And I was like, look, I need to invest this like a 60 year old. Mm -hmm. And he, he's like, OK, whatever. But while I was retired and hanging out and just relaxing, I was still learning and still keeping up with things and still staying on top of all the technology. And he would ask me all these technology questions. And he would ask me about these companies that were public. And I'd never done anything with the stock market, didn't really know much about it yeah. other than the financial. You know, I, I understood everything behind it. I just never got into it. And then he had me talking to all these big um, analysts and everything that were big names that I had heard of. And, and so I'm like, OK, well, maybe I should start trading these stocks, you know, because mm -hmm. I know more than these analysts do about what's going on with these networking companies. Because what Michael Solutions got really good at was doing custom integration, but also doing local and wide area networks. Mm -hmm. So we were able to connect companies together around the world and understand all the technology and develop around it. And, and so I started trading stocks and crushed it. <laughs> I mean, I, would, I was winning these stock um, trading contests. You know, Jim Cramer, the guy from Mad Money. Yeah, 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 Mad Money, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, I would talk to him and he would take my trading advice and all that. And, you know, this is way back when. And I mean, literally, I was, you know, taking that $2 million and making 80%, then another 80%, then 90%. And just like, bam, 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 until my broker turned it into, had me create a um, hedge fund, which I mm -hmm. sold within like nine months, <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah, that's so, nuts. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah. So that took me to the next level and really set me up so that when we started AudioNet in the mid 90s, when the internet hit, I was good to go financially. I was set, I yeah. mean, for life. And, and really, you know, my biggest motivation that entire time was I read this book, How to Retire by the Time You're 35. Mm -hmm. And it said, basically, if, if you can, you know, if you can save up enough money and live off the interest of that money from the bank to live like a student, 
why wouldn't you? And so that was my mission, right? Just live cheap. I used to keep my budget. I used to have it down. I used to have my own little personal QuickBooks, you know, where I would track everything and I would have all, you know, even back then I was, you know, automated paying my bills so that I was all precise. And so I had every angle possible and that was my goal. And so, you know, even though I was trading stocks, I was, I was running around doing whatever I wanted. You know, I was traveling the world with my lifetime pass, living on the beach in Manhattan with, you know, a couple of roommates. And then I had a house next to Keanu Reeves in Hollywood after that. I mean, taking acting lessons. I was just living the life. Yeah. And I went back cause to Dallas with some girl. I started dating again, Holly. And I sat down one day with um, my buddy, Todd Wagner from college. And we, you know, he started asking me all about the internet cause I knew networking. Mm -hmm. He was like, you know, you know, what do you think about sports? There's got to be a way we can listen to Indiana basketball using this whole new Internet thing. And then, bam, I was like, you know what? We could use the Internet to broadcast stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's try to figure it out because I understand networking. I understand how servers work and all that. I'm like, let me get to work on it. And then that was the start of this whole streaming industry. And, and then, and AudioNet became broadcast.com. Yep. So, and which was like your big success. So, that was my big hit, yeah. so talk about, talk about kind of broadcast.com, the IPO and yeah. Uh, yeah. So when we started AudioNet, it was effectively me and Todd. And then there's this other guy, Chris Jade that came in, but didn't really do anything. And then <laughs> that was a whole nother story, but we started out of the second bedroom of my house and I bought a Packard Bell computer and downloaded a Netscape server and started figuring out how to not stream, but make available on demand these different audio files. Mm -hmm. And then once we got that working, um, we partnered with a company called Zing, X-I-N-G, it's long gone. And I went to a um, local radio station and I said, look, this new internet thing, which you probably don't understand, it's gonna be the next cable television, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna be able to do audio and video and people anywhere in the world can get any, any music or video or anything they want bits or bits mm -hmm. bits don't care what they are you can transmit them anywhere around the world yeah and they're like, what what in the world are you talking about and i'm like look just trust me um it was a station called klif which has sports and news for dallas and so i i bought a like a 50 dollar vcr and that allowed you to record eight hours on a vhs tape you know the old vhs tapes yeah and so i went down there connected it to the board at the radio station and then i would bring it back home go through this process called encoding where you took the output of the video mm -hmm. excuse me and put it on the server and then i would go on to aol prodigy CompuServe, all these chat rooms you use net and i'd say look if you're interested in dallas sports and news and you live outside of dallas you know you got to go through these steps you know because you only had a dial up back then and you know, download this TCP IP, all this, all this rigmarole, and try it. And literally, it was just me typing and responding to all these people, telling people to try it. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, people started listening and listening and listening. It got bigger. And as it got bigger, we got, went and got more radio stations. And then the copyright laws were different back then, so we could take any CD that we wanted, burn it, and put <laughs> it on the server, and called it the the AudioNet jukebox. So you can wow. listen. To everything. <laughs> There was even, we got so big, um, even before we started doing bi video, there was a band, Matchbox 20, and they broke their first hit song, they broke on us. You know, we yeah. had Willie Nelson release albums on AudioNet and Broadcast.com. Wow. You know, oh, no, we were killing it. Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, with video on the horizon in 97, we brought bought the name Broadcast.com for $8,000, converted ourselves to Broadcast.com. By that time, we had like 400 radio stations like 10 TV stations that we were streaming. Um, we were live, obviously. We had, I don't even know how many thousands of, of albums, CDs on our jukebox, but by then we, we had to go get permission. And then we were, we had police scanners, we had, you know, made for, we had internet radio stations, so we had thousands of those. I mean, year round we were running Christmas songs, we, you know, just all the yeah. things you see on Pandora and Spotify today. Um, and then we went public July 18th of 1998 and bam, it was crazy. I mean, before the offering, we had to, fly, we had to do this thing called a road show and we would fly to cities around the world. Yeah. Know, yeah. Pitch, to pitching. get investors interested. Yeah. Yeah. To investors. They had no idea what we were talking about. People thought like we had all these CD players in the back room. It was just ridiculously, but they were into it, you know, cause yeah. by then the internet stocks were going crazy. And so when we launched on July 18th, I remember being in New York and 
go into the NASDAQ and they have to do this thing called opening the stock. Mm -hmm. And so they have to match buyers and sellers. And we priced at $18 and people are like, what are we going to open at? Because we knew the demand was there. And some people were like 25, 26. I was like, nah, 33. We're going to crush it. And they're like, no, you're crazy. Coming up on The Ones Who Succeed, why Mark Cuban wasn't that crazy. And why Mark believes the world's first trillionaire will be an AI trillionaire. We also talked about what he would do if he was a teenager looking to start his first business in 2020. That's all coming up. This is The Ones Who Succeed. I'm Campbell Barron. My conversation with Mark Cuban continues. Stay with us. This episode of The Ones Who Succeed is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform with thousands of classes in business, marketing, technology, design, and more. You can take classes in social media marketing, video editing, entrepreneurship, you name it, they've got it. So whether you're trying to deepen your professional skill set, start a side hustle, or just explore a new passion, Skillshare is there to keep you learning and thriving. So, ladies and gentlemen, here is the call to action. Skillshare is offering the ones who succeed listeners two months of unlimited access to thousands of classes all for free. To sign up, go to Skillshare.com slash succeed. Again, that's Skillshare.com slash succeed. That link is how they know the ones who succeed sent you to start your first two months now. You can find that link in the description of this podcast, and it would be awesome if you can support our show by supporting our sponsors. So one last time, visit Skillshare.com slash succeed to start your first two months of Skillshare Premium today. And thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring the show. back to the ones who succeed. I'm Campbell Barron, and I'm talking to the billionaire owner of the Dallas Mavericks and ABC's very own infamous shark, Mark Cuban. And we're going to pick up right where we left off. Mark is about to IPO a company he co-founded. It's called Broadcast.com. It's the late 90s, and some of Mark's peers are worried that Mark may have set the IPO price a little bit too high. And we priced at $18, and people were like, what are we going to open at? Because we knew the demand was there. And some people were like 25, 26. I was like, nah, 33, we're going to crush it. And they're like, no, you're crazy. It opened at like 62.75 or something ridiculous. Oh went up God. to $72 and then closed at 62 or something. It was the yeah. largest IPO pop, uh, first day IPO pop That's in the history nuts. of the stock market. It was crazy. And I had like 300,000 shares of stock. Yeah. And so I'm like, what the hell? Or what was it? Yeah, not 300, like three, like three, 30 million shares of stock or something crazy. Right. Yeah. And, and so I just remember my, one of my best friends, Ben calling me the, the next day or right afterwards, after the market closed and saying, you know, when the stock dropped from 72 to 62, you lost $300 million. Yeah. Or whatever. I'm like, thanks buddy. <laughs> and after that, we just went out and we found this bar Harry's, I think it was in wall street. And every time they mentioned broadcast.com, we did a shot. <laughs> and, and by six o'clock, I was passed out. You were, you were done. What a story. What a series of events. I mean, I, I think it'd be very interesting if broadcast.com was started a little bit later, like in the early to late, mid, late 2000s, there's a very high probability that if it didn't get acquired, I think it could still be a prominent thing Oh, no, today. we would be killing it. Look, yeah. if we hadn't sold to Yahoo, we, you know, we had done... 20 some million in sales, which, you know, in 19, late 1990, which doesn't seem huge, but we'd only lost like, I think our last public quarter before we sold a million dollars, a million and a half dollars. Yeah. And so think about it. By that time, um, we had bought 10% of what would become Lionsgate um, Studios. <laughs> so really? Movie studio. Wow. We, what else did we buy? We had this thing called Net Roadshow, which did online roadshows for companies. Um, we bought this um, company called SimpleNet which mm-hmm. allowed us to do up, um, allowed companies and individuals to, to upload their own video onto the net, internet and watch it, which obviously is the same thing that YouTube became. And so the only really challenge we had prior to selling to YouTube was the cost of bandwidth. Mm-hmm. And so we had to worry about living out because it was so much more expensive then. And that was, you know, and so we sold to, to Yahoo, but we got paid in Yahoo stock. And if Yahoo, if the, st- the bubble hadn't burst, or even if Yahoo had just kept their shit together, There'd be no YouTube. There'd be no Pandora. There'd be yeah. no Spotify. 
you know, and a hundred other online, you know, Zoom, who knows, right? But, yeah. I mean, we did, I mean, we were doing it right, but it turned out okay for me. Yeah, you, 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 uh, you made it, you made it out uh, the other side. And I think what's really interesting about kind of this next chapter in your career is the kind of your ambition to help other entrepreneurs. What, what specifically intrigued you about angel investing and when did you kind of start to get into that world? I started probably getting into it in the early 2000s, probably 2003, 2004, maybe 2005 is really when I started to kick in. And it really was for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to try to help businesses, but two, I wanted to see if I still had it. You know, mm-hmm. you, know you always want to test yourself and challenge yourself and see if you could do it again and again, because I've yeah, done, yeah. You know, been successful with micro solutions, been successful with broadcast.com and everybody's always got the golden touch and, you know, and then the Mavs, you know, they went from, you know, being losers all of a sudden to winning, Yeah, you know, I never hit a jump shot. So that wasn't me, but I did screw it up. Right. And so I started connecting and really most of the deals I did were just via email, you know, and to give you a frame of reference, there was a point in time when I was helping Travis Klonick, um, who would go on to start Uber. Yeah. Um, the guys from box.com mm-hmm. and a bunch of other people have been really successful entrepreneurs and I'd connected via, except for Travis, all of them via email, you know, the box.com guys, I invested in them before I'd even met them. Mm-hmm. You know, they were just yeah. you know, college kids and, you know, Scooter Braun, you know, going back and forth with him, even though we never did an investment. And so I just, I just really enjoyed it because these, these guys were, these men and women were peppering me with questions. I could help them and give them some guidance and, you know, it didn't always work, but it turned out pretty well for a lot of them. Yeah. And, uh, you mentioned Travis who started Uber. Is it true that you passed on the seed round of Uber? Well, okay. So first of all, I helped Uber, um, Uber, I helped Travis with his first company, Red Swoosh. Yeah. Yeah. And so I bailed him out, you know, and so, <laughs> and so he, but to his credit, he, he burned the, the midnight. He busted his ass and we had a good exit on that for like $18 million. Mm-hmm. And then when Uber cab came along, I was like, dude, I love the idea, but you're going to have all these challenges with the taxi cab commissions. And so we need to talk about, you know, what your raising is and, you know, what I get for my money and never heard back from him. That's when oh, no, that he, goes to you. It, he just found somebody else who, who didn't, didn't think twice and gave him the money. Yeah. So, so, so you're making these angel investments. It seems like at this point you kind of were still quite in tune with like the Silicon Valley world, right? Like Uber box. That's kind of all a tight knit community. Yeah. But you um, know what? I never really connected it to Silicon Valley at all. So These you, are just kids that were emailing me, you know, and and I, I still have all those emails today. I mean, there were times when I had Aaron Levy and Travis and me and some other folks all on email threads discussing business. It was great. That's awesome. So and that's really cool. And so I guess you you, you clearly like liked angel investing and like being involved with these entrepreneurs. Yep. And I so the so what's interesting to me is um, I know you from Shark Tank, but I also kind of know you. Just you, I hear your your name thrown around a lot, just kind of in the entrepreneurial business community. My brother doesn't really watch Shark Tank, and he knows you as the owner of the Mavs, right. and so and his friends. Know, and so that seems like you're kind of in these two kind of very distinct, Circles, yeah. yeah, worlds. So let's talk about Shark Tank. I talked to Chris Saka, who is he's been on Shark Tank a few times. I know you love him, and uh, I, I like Chris yeah. a lot. Um, and um, so how did how did you kind of get involved with Shark Tank? So. Um, in 2009, they reached out to me and I thought that I was going to have an opportunity to do it, but I was in a battle with the SEC at the time. Mm-hmm. And so ABC said, no, we can't use Mark Cuban. And then as it became clear to everybody that, you know, my thing with the SEC was a joke and I ended up kicking their ass like yeah. badly. Um, then 2000, they started airing 2009 and then 2010, they brought me back in and they made me audition. Really? And so, and just like sitting there like this with a camera in front of me, just peppering me with questions. <laughs> and I guess they liked it. So I went in 2010, I went on as a guest shark. So they had Jeff Foxworthy do three episodes and they had me do three episodes. And I went on there thinking, you know what, this is a show that's bounced around on the schedule. One night is Tuesday night. The next night is the, re- you know, a temporary replacement for desperate housewives on. ABC, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And so, I'm thinking I'm going to do my three episodes. This show's not going to last. It's a business show um, shows how much I know. And I'm just going to have fun. 
And I went on there just raising hell. If you could see yeah. those first episodes when I was a guest, they were hysterical because, you know, the, the folks, you know, Kevin and Damon and Barbara, et cetera, yeah. who've been on there a while, they were, they were used to, they kind of had their own rhythm of doing things, right? Mm-hmm. And I just, just torched them, right? I was just giving them shit the whole time, doing deals, like not paying attention. You know, they would try to nickel and dime every deal. I was like, I don't care, right? If it's a good deal, it's a good deal. And some of them were just stupid and I was just doing it for the TV side of it. But I, I had a blast. And then they came, they brought me back to, to do it again for what would be the season three. And I haven't missed an episode since. And I mean, like, I think what's interesting about Shark Tank is I, I think along with you, if, if someone pitched me the idea of a show about business, I mean, being really interested in business, I still probably would think that's a dumb idea. Right? Yeah, because, and, you know, but the producers were great, you know, um, they really knew their stuff. And I'd worked with one of them before, Clay um, Newbill. And the way they edit it, you know, to make it, because in real time, those things can go on for an hour, two hours, and they edit yeah. it in 15 minutes. And so just their ability to do that is really good. I mean, they're really good at it. And so, you know, like they said, we'll never make a shark look bad. We'll always edit it so you guys look come out okay. Mm-hmm. And that's what they do. And they make it entertaining and and. You know, so it's not really business. It's more inspirational. Yeah. And that's really what makes it work. I think it is. It has excelled the idea and essentially essentially the American dream, if you will. Um, do you remember what your first investment was on the show? Yeah, it was a company called Toy Guru. And yeah. it was just, I did it with Kevin and it was just turned out to be awful. It's <laughs> a great idea. Great I idea. I know. So basically, because when I did it, that was 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, my kids, you know, were one, three, and six, basically. And so I was having to deal with all the issues that, you know, having young kids and Toy Guru, what it did was it said, okay, we're going to, we're going to send you toys for $40 a month. We're going to send you a box of probably $300 worth of toys that your kids will use until they're bored. And mm-hmm. they're obviously going to get bored. And then when they're, you're done with them, you ship them back to us and we'll send you another box. We'll take the ones you ship back. We'll disinfect them, clean them up and ship them on to somebody else. And it was great. You know, the subscribers are going up and I mean, you know, when the show aired, it just gave him a huge boost. And so we would talk to the um, CEO, the entrepreneur behind the company, Kevin and I, and we're like, okay, we'll help you. We'll go to PTA meetings, you know, we'll help you sell. And they're like, no, we just want to do more TV shows. I like, no, you got to actually do the work. Yeah. No, we, we, we just want to do PR. I'm like, are you kidding me? And then they got into fights. The two, the CEO and the original entrepreneurs got into oh, fights. That's dangerous. And they just yeah. decided we don't want to work together anymore. So the company went. Jeez. So, I mean, what, I think one of the things that was interesting for me to find out about the show, kind of talking with Chris and also the mechanics, I mean, when you say you're going to do a deal, that doesn't mean you're going to do a deal. So right. what percentage of the deals do you, do you think, like, have you realized that actually go through? For me, it's about 60%. And of the 40% that don't close, 90% are because the entrepreneur misled me about something or they failed to disclose something. So a lot of times it's, oh, yeah, I didn't tell you about the debt because you didn't ask. Well, yeah, you no, know, and you have, you know, 200,000, you know, 25 percent of your equity is tied up in debt. Right. Mm-hmm. Or I asked him about debt and, oh, I didn't think credit cards counted or, you know, the widget. You said the widget cost a dollar to make, which is true. But, you know, you got to make a million of them and you sold 37, you know, that type of stuff. And then right. some now more recently. Now that the show's gotten so big, particularly Silicon Valley companies will come on and say, no, we decided we didn't like that deal. I'm like, wait, you committed to it. Yeah. And it's more like, well, no, we just wanted the commercial. Right. So so you get some of those. But Mm -hmm. never have I ever said, you know what, you're exactly right. You're doing everything the way you said. And I'm still not going to do the deal. Yeah. yeah. It's it's always I mean, and to be fair, I think the people that are kind of going to try to act in a deceptive manner, you don't really want to be in business with them anyway. No, no. And so it kind of it kind of acts as like this double filter. Um, has being a shark changed your perspective on anything? Um, I think it just helped me appreciate. Well, I'll tell you, here's where it's changed. The reason I continue to do the show, because it's a pain in the ass. Doing the show is easy. Right. But when now, you know, I'm at 100 plus companies from Shark Tank alone, that's a lot of work, you know, and there's a lot of especially now with the pandemic, there's a lot of stress for these companies. And I can't just turn my back on them. I've got to help as much as I can. And I've got people that work for me that do a great job. But I did. I 
have done it and continue to do it because it sends, and you alluded to it early, sends the message the American dream is alive and well. And what really changed my perspective is pe- parents that come up to me all the time and tell me about their kids that have started business cause, businesses because they watch Shark Tank together. And so Sony owns the TV show and they, they put it on ABC, obviously. And so I went to show Sony and I'm like, wait, you know, how do we stand in terms of families watching television? You know, how do we rate relative to everybody else? And, mm-hmm. you know, it turns out we're one of the top three shows that families watch together in all the television. That's incredible. And, and so that really was, you know, eye opening to me because it really meant that it was a family entertainment and B people, you know, families and their kids, parents love the fact that their kids were watching the show and learning about business. And mm-hmm. so that really was a surprise to me and really exciting and a big reason why I continue today. Like, like being an angel investor or a venture investor, kind of in general, yeah, I mean, you're gonna, you'll have passed on opportunities you maybe wish you didn't. Um, do you regret passing on any opportunities and how do you kind of deal with that? No, Is that kind really. of just part of the game? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, we, we'll sit there, we'll get there in the morning, we'll see 10 deals a day. Mm-hmm. And there's just so many of them. It's not like, you know, oh, we have one day, one deal, and then you just get to ruminate about it the whole time. You know, it's just, no. Once mm-hmm. it's gone, I mean, people say, well, what about this deal? Why didn't, you know, did you, I don't even remember it. Over all the years, there's been so yeah. many. Yeah. Yeah. And, and are there any investments that are most memorable that you've made, like your favorite? Yeah. I mean, there's one called Cycloramic. And what Cycloramic did was, um, back in the day, the the Apple had a flat bezel. The bottom was flat, and they they were really innovative. So they had an app that used the sensors to make it turn, and then they took the the pictures and stitched them together into oh, like a, a video. yeah, that's so cool, yeah, yeah, very cool. Well, until and it was great until Apple changed the the physical format of the phone, and so to their credit, Francois, the the CEO, um, and his team, who are all from Georgia Tech, said, okay you know, we're going to find new ways to use this and we're going to evolve into computer vision. And mm-hmm. so it literally turned into my first computer vision investment, which I learned a lot from. And they brought in, they recognized, it wasn't me, it was them that recognized that there was a real need for companies trying to sell cars online, mm-hmm. you know, because people want to see the inside of the car. They want to turn the car and use the mouse to turn it around. Yeah. And so they evolved to this auto-driven computer vision um, solution. So like now, if you go to Carvana, You'll, you have the ability to use your mouse or touch screen and open doors and turn the cars. And that's because Carvana bought um, Cycloramic. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And they bought them for some cash, but also a lot of stock. And that stock has gone up six times, you know, oh, 100%. That's and so, great. You know, so they went from stuck to pivoting to crushing it. Yeah, and so, I mean, it, it's truly an American success story. I mean, that that's that's kind of what it comes down to. Why you would much rather bet on the jockey than the idea, right? Because the idea could change. Yeah, and, and so, you know, I try to do both, right? One yeah. is with, with Shark Tank, you also have that little nuance of you know you have the commercial, right? So mm-hmm. you get you get that initial push to see what it's like, but most of them, you know, it's you know they're all different, right? Because it covers such a gamut. But you know, sometimes the trends work in your favor, and sometimes, like now, they don't. But, you know, we've had we have one company um, that I, I'm proud of, Unreal Deli, which is vegan corned beef, which is incredible. It's just mm-hmm. so good. But now with all the concern about meat and meat pricing going up and people shopping, you know, online and grocery stores, their business is crushing it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, like things change and you've got to be adaptive. So switching gears here, this is something I'm really interested in. I read that um, you once said if you were growing up and you were born, you know, post dot com boom, you'd most likely be a millionaire, but not necessarily a billionaire. Yeah. What do you mean by that? That's very. That's a very bold thing to say. Yeah, not to me. I mean, you know, I think I have those traits that would have gotten me there, and I'll tell you what they are. One, I'm a tech geek. I love to learn. Right. Mm-hmm. There's just, you know, you see all these books. I mean, yeah. all the screens. I try everything. Mm-hmm. You know, I go online. I, you know, I, I'm conversing at least in machine learning versus neural networks versus GANs versus reinforcement learning networks. I can I can tell you the difference. Right. And I understand it because I, you know, I, I, that's the stuff I love to do. Mm-hmm. You combine that with a, a good, solid base of business understanding. So like when you watch Shark Tank, one of my strongest skills is I can get to the I can understand and get to the heart of an issue with a business you know, while everybody else is still trying to figure it out. 
Mm -hmm. And that's really been one of my greatest skills. So you can find that in tech and my ability to sell. And so there's no way that I wouldn't be able to figure it out. Now, I'm not saying everyone would make it. Every business I tried would would be a complete success. But, you know, as I've shown, I'm not going to quit. I'll find something else. Like right now, you know, I've got my little Alexa here. I have Cortana. I have a Google Home over there. Yeah. Scripting in Alexa is easy. It's super easy. But nobody knows that. You know, it comes across as being very difficult. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> you triggered her. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. But like, so, you know, I, I just started to learn scripting. So just teach myself yeah, yeah. on basic scripting, right? Now, particularly with the pandemic, where we want to go touch free in as many places as possible, ambient mm -hmm. computing is going to be huge. Yeah. So being able to really, you know, and being excited to put in the time to learn these new things, and then knowing how to apply them to different things, and then being able to sell them, I don't have any doubt in my mind that I'd be able to, you mm -hmm. know, and and I, <laughs> and and so yeah. So on that note, if it, let's say you lost all your money today in 2020, uh -huh. you were starting from zero, or I guess you were a teen. I guess my age, you were starting out. How would you build wealth again? How would you? So as a teen, or yeah, as a parent with kids? I mean, as a teen. Let's do as a teen because I guess they are. Said, I would scripting. I would learn everything there is to know about Alexa and Google Home. Mm -hmm. I would be the go-to person, and I would just you know I would have all this. I'd have a whole library of scripts so that when I walked into your house, I'd be able to say, here, bring up your Alexa um, app and let me show you a few things and let's have some fun with it and mess with people. And then if you want to do some more things, you know, to help with whatever it is around the house and connect things, I'm going to charge you $35 an hour and I can make your life a lot more efficient. And oh, by the way, let me show you how I can use that for business. And, oh, by the way, let me walk into this car dealership that I know sells cars that's supports Alexa and let me show you how to offer these features for your customers so they have a reason to buy from you instead of somebody else and I could be 15 years old let's make it 16 so I have to drive to the dealership yeah and get done. that's that's a really insightful answer I'm a huge huge Alexa fan there's this have you uh, written scripts yeah so there's this site called voice flow have you heard of voice flow yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, I'm a big, I'm, I'm a power user of voice flow. And so I'm a, uh, I just for fun and, and tinker easy. with it. It's, it's really very easy. easy. Yeah, I know. Particularly now with the pandemic, like we're looking at it for the Mavs, right? How can you say things instead of touch things? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And so I guess how would, how would your answer change if you were, uh, if I mean, you are a parent, so how would your answer change if you're, I'd get a day you're... job to pay the bills first, no matter what it was working as a bartender or working at a McDonald's. And I'd work at night doing the same things I just explained to you. Yeah, yeah. And and I, and on that note of kind of voice and uh, Alexa, I read that you said you believe that the first, the world's first trillionaire will be an AI trillionaire. Yeah. Um, I'm sure we over. I'm sure the answers will overlap. But what do you mean by an AI trillionaire? Kind of just debunk that a little bit so if you don't mind. Right now, the world kind of has evolved with AI into AI haves and AI have nots. Mm -hmm. And so you've got the big companies: Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google etc that are really good at ai and they really have data sources and they have the financial wherewithal to spend the billions of dollars for engineers and data scientists and cloud computing that small to medium-sized businesses don't have and that gives them a significant advantage and it's not just for domestic commerce or global commerce it's also for military it's also mm -hmm. for you know how nations are going to compete Russia and China have both come out and said, whoever dominates um, AI is going to dominate the future. And so, no, you know, AI is going to have an incredible impact, but there's going to be somebody who comes along that comes up with a better way because AI is still hard and AI is still expensive. You, you know, just the, the computing cost is incredible. The personnel cost is incredible. The environmental impact, you know, because of the computing challenges is incredible. So mm -hmm. there'll be somebody who comes up with a better way. There'll be somebody who comes up with a way that takes it to the next level in terms yeah. of, you know, AGI. There's just so many places that this can go because it's relatively inefficient and in its infancy relative, not, not to the impact, but to the cost of doing business. Yeah. And it's so difficult right now for small businesses to use. So I, I invested in a company called Node.io, you know, along those same lines. How do you take AI and make it available to small to medium-sized companies who can't afford their own, you know, their own AI impl implementations? And so whoever solves that, 
It's going to be huge. It's going to be the next Einstein. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's get on to these rapid fire questions, like as quick of an answer as possible. Biggest pet peeve. People chew with their mouth open. <laughs> um, most underrated character trait in an entrepreneur. Sales. Someone you admire. Bill Gates. Uh, favorite book of all time. Fountainhead. One investment you regret you passed on. Top golf. Biggest risk you took. Oh my God. I'm not a big risk taker. I always thought that, you know, cause I had, when I was starting companies, I had nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. So probably, but probably micro solutions, starting micro solutions. Yeah. Favorite place on earth with my, anywhere with my family. What do you hope your legacy will be? My kids are happy, healthy and living, you know, lives that they're enjoying. Favorite social media. TikTok. Thoughts on TikTok. I love TikTok. I mean, that is an AI driven solution, yep. right? People don't realize it's not like other social media because it's not about who you follow. It's about what you watch. Mm-hmm. And that just makes it totally different. Yeah. What type of phone do you use? I have Samsung and iPhone on two different networks because I never want to get stuck because I do everything via email. Yep. I never want to get stuck without having access. Should billionaires be taxed more? Tax more? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And lastly, in this rapid fire question, will you run for office? Maybe. Okay. And then my last question, if you reflect on your success and your journey as an entrepreneur, do you think you were born an entrepreneur? That's a great question. Um, It feels like it, yes. But like my brothers are totally different. You know, so I'd, I'd say yes for me, yes. Mark Cuban, I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. That's Mark Cuban, one of the ones who succeed. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, it would be amazing if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us out. Or while you're at it, tell a friend. That also helps new listeners discover the show. If you want to see clips from the show and stay up to date with what I'm working on, you could follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Campbell J. Barron. And my YouTube channel is my name, Campbell Barron. You've made it to the end of the show. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Campbell Barron, and I'll be back in no time.